Good afternoon, good evening, everyone, uh, wherever you may be in the world, and welcome to this, the second in the series of the WCRC um, plenary monthly lecture series. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you all. Um, some housekeeping now before we get into the actual uh, lectures. Um, so can I please ask all of you, apart from the speaker that is, um, to keep your microphones on mute so that the speakers are not disturbed uh, during their presentations. Um, if you require interpretation, you need to go to the bottom of your screen and you'll see that there is um, um, a translation button and choose the, the language uh, that you want to have translated into. And then at the end of each of the presentations, there'll be an opportunity for questions. And we ask you please to put those questions in the chat um, and we will um, make sure that we ask the presenters the questions. So with that, uh, let me start by introducing our first speaker, uh, Dr. Raja Reddy. Um, now, I'm last, at the last session, we had two world-renowned scientists, and I'm delighted to say that we're able to have another two world-renowned scientists um, talk to us today. And uh, Dr. Red Reddy has over 32 years of experience at Mississippi State University, and I know that all of you will already know him, but he is globally renowned for his outstanding work on modeling the impact of climate change on cotton, uh, remote sensing and crop modeling applications. He is a fellow of the Crop Science Society of America and the American Society of America. Uh, he's trained numerous scientists over the years and postdocs and and, and has published over 300 journal per, pa papers and book chapters and has won several national and international awards. Um, but perhaps most importantly, um, Dr. Reddy has recently been selected as the ICAC Researcher of the Year for 2020. And uh, I would like to personally congratulate you on that, uh, Dr. Reddy. And I know that um, everyone on, on this Zoom chat will also be uh, wishing you uh, congratulations as well. So with that, uh, uh, Dr. Reddy, we'll be delighted to hear your presentation on the physiological implications and challenges. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. The, I'm Dr. Reddy, as I've uh, been introduced, and uh, um, thank you, Dr. Hughes, for, uh, for the introduction. I'm delighted to present um, some of the work that I've been doing over the years here at Mississippi State. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I thank the ICAC for inviting me and also for the honor receiving the ICAC Researcher of the Year. Thank, thank you for, for the committee and also ICAC for this honor. And um, today I'm going to be talking about um, cotton and climate change the topic that I am going to be looking at is more, more or less looking at experimental uh, um, experimental approaches to climate change and uh, cotton growth and developmental aspects. I, I will be presenting mostly on physiological challenges, implications and challenges. Uh, let me share first my screen and then see how it goes. <laughs> um, I am a, bio, a biologist and plant physiologist my background. I came to Mississippi State and we, I started working with the crop models. Uh, crop, crop scientists working more interested in crop model development. With that I got interested in uh, this uh, wonderful plant. I started to learn how it goes and kind of thing. Cotton is one, is one of the wonderful, wonderful crop among all the 20 species that I have been working on because it is uh, one of the uh, physiologically it is an indeterminate growth habit makes makes it a lot of difference and it's very plastic in its approach in its growth habit so it is a kind of response to the environment response to the resources response to the uh, it also puts some challenges to understand the whole plant physiology to a certain extent the if you look at the left hand side 
this is not um, an isolated plant this is a middle of the middle of the row plant that we had been one of the earlier varieties it's a texas marker one he has uh, more than 100 it's middle of the plant that is middle of the row it has more than 100 balls on it um, so it has a huge potential so much of this potential to a certain extent is being lost with environmental stresses so my you know, started my work started with the understanding stress effects on growth and development particularly wanted to quantify the stress effects on many growth and developmental aspects that could be incorporated into in, into cotton simulation models as we all know that um, the population is on the rise uh, recently in the exponential rise and uh, we are at uh, 7.8 billion and expected by 2050 which is about 30 years from now um, 9.8 8 billion by 2050 that is almost like a 2 billion more people that means uh, not only food is uh, one of the aspects that comes into mind the fiber uh, also this um, the wonderful plant that provides the natural fiber is also uh, an issue now because we may be competing with land resources to make more fiber by increasing the land area to a certain extent that may not be that uh, uh, imminently possible because we have a competition coming from other crop species as well <clears throat> but if you look at the cotton that's grown in several countries uh, maybe over 70 plus countries um, it is grown under a wide range of environmental conditions and also soils and also the management management in terms of selecting varieties and also make, making the best use of those varieties in a given environment several people are involved to produce um, over a million people produce cotton that we use today and uh, if you look at um, any given location uh, the one important aspect is no two seasons are equal so you can look at here at mississippi state for example it's a stonewall mississippi the mississippi delta area um, we if we look at temperature alone there is a dark line that is a, a long-term averages and then you can look at the blue line is one year the red line is another year you can see that the minimum and optimum temperature the straight lines you can see those differences among those two years that makes almost like what the difference between blue and the red line almost like equivalent to what is projected in the climate change to a certain extent changes in temperature conditions so this is um, this makes uh, uh, the more important aspect is quantifying and understanding stress factor effects on crop growth and development to a certain extent that is one of them uh, one of the aspect that i've been working on for the last 30 years on the top of it we are currently we are getting the one of the uh, challenges that we have is the global climate change with that we i'm not going to go i'm not an expert on the climate change aspects because i'm going to um, have just introduced this thing and then move on to my my aspects so the climate climate change includes greenhouse gas changes they are going they are projected to increase uh, temperatures are also projected to increase with increase in um, with the projected um, increase in greenhouse gases and also there is a um, projected changes in the asymmetry of temperature means more nighttime temperatures are projected to increase in the future um, with um, um, with the extreme events to a certain extent and then the glaciers the water resources are also um, become like a scarcity um, commodity in the future and then the ocean levels are go rising up to a certain extent the most important among all of them is the precipitation patterns and also the drought intensities are projected to increase some aspects that i've been working on is that is on the ground level ev ev level on crop growth and development to certain certain extent that is also projected to change uh, over the years at least in the near near future and more importantly the extreme events are projected to increase in the future climate as well most of them i am going to give one, one example of co2 and then the contributing fa factors that comes with uh, 
uh, is the carbon emission either through fossil fuel consumption or through the natural um, processes. So there is a linkage between changes in uh, carbon emission to changes in carbon dioxide CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. As CO2 is increasing, many of them, many of the crop plants or the natural ecosystems will utilize, but we are putting more than they can they can sequester. That's the reason we are continuous. We are seeing the continuous raise in CO2 concentration uh, from pre-industrial to the current level. Current level is about uh, 412, um, 412 ppm. When I came here to this lab, we were conducting experiments around 3, 340 ppm. Now we are conducting around 400 by the time we get into something like a publication wise, it is almost like an ambient CO2 level to a certain extent. So the future CO2 levels are projected anywhere from 730 to 1000 ppm by 2100. With those changes, temperatures are anywhere projected from lowest to, to 0.6 to 0.4 degrees. And then the sea levels are also projected to rise relative to the um, almost like 0.18 to 0.9 meters. With these changes, the plants are going to be affected to a certain extent. So <clears throat> if you look at what are the factors that affect plants in general is CO2 is not really a stress factor, but it's a, one of the raw material that plants can utilize it. Under low CO2 levels, it is a kind of um, plants are going to be growing slowly, but under higher CO2 levels, most of the plants will be growing more <clears throat> with increase in CO2 levels temperatures including extremes will have, will have a drastic effect on plant growth and development. Radiation is an important component including UV radiation also, precipitation patterns, drought, drought intensities, flooding also. We haven't done much work on flooding. We started recently and the soil minerals including heavy metals and the salinity also to a certain extent. Our lab started to work on multiple crops using including cotton on salinity levels, but we haven't done a whole lot of work on salinity to a certain extent. So most of my work today's work is mostly done in the sunlit chambers. Sunlit chambers are now they are naturally lit. At the same time, we have a, a large plexiglass chambers about 2.5 meters tall, half a meter wide um, growing area. And then most of the environmental factors in these chambers are controlled uh, to a certain extent. The reason they designed this experiment is to develop a functional algorithms for, that can be used for modeling purpose. So they wanted to have a plants that are grown in the sunlit, sunlit conditions without any artificial light so that um, the results can be portable from these experimental conditions to the field conditions. Why, why sunlit chambers? One of them is a recent study that is reported in 2020 um, by Alan et al. They found, they found that sunlit cham chambers are the best suited for climate change studies compared to many others. It has more advantages to a certain extent. And over the years, <coughs> we have developed this. We are the only one group that have developed some um, functional algorithms for cotton over 200 functional algorithms that are being incorporated into the cotton simulation model called GOSIM. And, and it's being tested not only at the farmer's producer level, but also on the other agencies to make some sort of policy decision. Here on the right hand side, just wanted to show you how this uh, functions, studies to functions to modeling to field applications. Here, cotton that is grown in the 14 southern states in the US. Uh, actual yields. These are the predicted yields using the cotton model. And I know you, you can see some sort of um, closely associated um, results between the uh, actual and also the projected yields using the cotton model. For that reason, it's uh, the results are, that are obtained to a certain extent in the sunlit chambers are more or less portable to the field conditions. So first I would uh, uh, like to present uh, something um, mostly on the photosynthesis to a certain extent. As we all know, this uh, photosynthesis is the main process that utilizes uh, carbon and water and, uh, and converts sun energy into usable carbohydrates. And, and if you look at, um, 
uh, put a dot on any cotton leaf or um, it, it has about two, more than 250 sco uh, stomates on a millimeter, almost like a dot has that many uh, stomates. They, these stomates open and close depending upon the environmental conditions. And, um, and if you look at, um, there are about 250,000 higher plant species on, uh, on earth. Of, of the 250,000, 89% of them are C3 photosynthetic model and cotton is C3, C3 photosynthetic model. Cotton, uh, soybean, rice, wheat, and many, al almost majority of these uh, trees are C3 photosynthetic model. And then there are about 3.2%, um, 8,000 belongs to C4 photosynthetic model. The reason for that one, I'm bringing that one is a C4, um, in evolutionary terms were they evolved around 30 million, million years ago, but they were discovered in late 70, late 60s. Um, they have a CO2 enriching mechanism so that they can function at a higher, they can, they, their photosynthetic efficiency is much higher than normal compared to the C3 plants. Uh, so they try to eliminate the uh, vegetable process called the C uh, photorespiration that is there in C3 plants. So the rest of them is uh, 8,000 is, um, 20,000 is 8% uh, of the 250,000 belongs to the camp plants. So the cotton being a C3, C3 plants, it responds to CO2 conditions very nicely. Here is an example, two, two examples. One of them is uh, canopy photosynthesis, milligram CO2 per meter square per second as a function of carbon dioxide. As you can see, um, Compared to the previous uh, previous slide, C C4 plants to C3 plant, the crossover response is around 420, 430 ppm. But C3 plants, uh, it increases with increase in CO2 photosynthesis, photosynthesis increases with increase in CO2 up to 700 ppm. So cotton is almost similar to majority of the C3 plants. You can see that the CO2 photosynthesis increases with the increase in CO2 up to 700 ppm. You can also witness, this is just a harvester last week, um, a day before yesterday actually, we were trying to test whether still have that uh, early season growth response to elevated CO2. And you can see this increase in CO2 concentration. These are about a month old cotton seedlings, increases up to 700 and then saturates around here, almost similar to the photosynthesis that we see it. So the photosynthesis biomass leaf area, almost uh, those responses are, are almost leveling off around 700 ppm to a certain extent. Beyond that, other factors are going to come and limit uh, um, photosynthesis to a certain extent. So the next, these and the next few slides I'm going to show you it is almost like a year's worth of data coming from those, each, each and every one of those slides. Here we are looking at uh, cotton canopy photosynthesis, grams of CO2 per meter square per day as a function of solar radiation. The light, when the canopies are intercepting all the light, this is uh, how the variability in uh, light interception as a, as a function of um, solar radiation, as a function of canopy photosynthesis. You can see that at a wide range of solar radiation environment, plants grown under future CO2 conditions are producing higher or greater photosynthesis compared to the plants grown at ambient CO2. One thing here is if we, if we could able to increase the potential, here this potential and the ambient condition, this potential by 10% or 20%, um, that makes a lot more difference. It responds to, um, photosynthetic response to radiation will make a lot of difference. Oops. Oof.
Here we are looking at uh, in this uh, slide we did one experiment in 1995. It's a similitude experiment. It is only possible something like facilities what we have here. Uh, so here we are looking at 1995 ambient temp ambient condition ambient temperature conditions. We control one chamber 1995. Excuse me. Okay. 1995 ambient um, conditions and with the 15 minute delay, both diurnally and seasonally for the whole growing season. Here plants go at ambient CO2 conditions, 1995 ambient temperature conditions with elevated CO2 is the red line on here. This, the upper one is um, top upper left is the ambient minus two degrees, plus two degrees, plus five degrees, plus seven degrees to ambient temperature condition. What the point I wanted to make is up across a wide range of temperature conditions for the whole growing season, plants grown at a future CO2 levels are doing much better producing higher, greater, bio, greater photosynthesis uh, across the whole growing season. We'll come back to that one uh, about the growth and development a little bit later. So the, the intent is the temperature optimum did not change much but uh, the minimum and the maximum changed a little bit for plants grown under future CO2 conditions. But the optimal temperature is, did not change that much. But across, across a wide range of temperatures, plants, C3 plants like cotton will benefit with increase in CO2, CO2 conditions to a certain extent. The increase is much almost like a parallel. And then if we can increase this potential here to here, that makes a lot of difference. So in, in looking at the photosynthesis, that is uh, increasing the potential is makes a lot more difference um, in the future conditions to certain extent. He, here, another, another whole season experiment. Um, when we give plants all the water they needed, then monitor at, um, at the noon time leaf water potential is one of the indicators of how stressful the plants are. When, when we give all the water they needed, they show the midday leaf water potential anywhere from minus 0.10 to minus, uh, minus 1.0 to 1.2. Around these areas, their well watered plants will show midday leaf water potential around this range. When plants are under stress, they go under um, mild water stress here, severe water stress in this condition. And photosynthesis here, we are looking at plant, cotton plant photosynthetic response to the uh, drought conditions across a wide range of drought conditions. And the lines are parallel. Plants grown at elevated CO2 produce greater, bio, greater photosynthesis compared to the plants grown at uh, ambient CO2 conditions. Again, increasing the potential makes a lot more difference. We did some other work in other crop species. Increasing that potential had the response if you increase this potential here to here, that response stays like this. So that increasing potential photosynthesis makes a lot more dif difference. The response to water stress, it, it may not be that much in many, many of the species that we looked at. They're, they almost look similar to a certain extent. Again, another experiment, the whole season experiment almost, looking at uh, UV radiation. So changes in stratospheric ozone level causes variability among the UV levels. It varies de depending upon the season and also the location. Spatially and temporarily, it varies. Here I'm showing the uh, so solar ground level <coughs> solar UV radiation from <laughs> Uh, Mr. Abdul Rahim, can you please uh, mute your mic, please? Mr. Abdul Rahim. Uh, here we are looking at seasonal trends in solar UV radiation at the ground level. Um, maximum levels reaches around five to six uh, kilojoules per meter square per day uh, around um, June, July time frame. And, and then here we are looking at the uh, UV radiation effects on photosynthesis here. Plants gone at uh, ambient CO2, the red balls, 
plants grown at elevated CO2, which is a green bar. You can see that at, across a wide range of UV levels, the plants grown at elevated CO2 are benefiting, are producing more, more photosynthesis across a wide range of UV levels to a certain extent. And uh, we, and uh, I'm uh, here. We are looking at uh, uh, another another whole season experiment that is done for the whole season diff using different units. Um, and then when we monitor uh, leaf leaf nitrogen content and photosynthesis response, and you can see that uh, the blue the blue line is the plants for plants grown at ambient CO2 levels, and the red red um, uh, red circles and then the line is the plants grown at elevated CO2. The, the one couple of points, the response are almost uh, similar, almost declines with a decrease in leaf nitrogen content, well fertilized here, less well fertilized here. Um, and then if we can increase this potential to a certain extent, say in between these two lines, that will be a greater achievement uh, under changing CO2 condition to a certain extent. Similar to this, um, we also did uh, several other experiments like phosphorus, potassium, uh, nutrition. They showed almost similar trends and uh, plants grown at elevated CO2 has an added advantage in fixing more carbon at a range of potassium levels and a ra range of um, phosphorus levels to a certain extent. So with this, uh, what I could uh, say is um, if we can increase the potential, there is a greater chance of plants can perform much better uh, even in today's environment, but also in the future condition to a certain extent under a wide range of environmental stress conditions. Then we are looking at, wanted to look at, uh, can, can we see the same, same response for water use? If we look at, um, as I said earlier, if you put a dot on the leaf, there will, each dot will have about 250 stomates like this. They open, close, depending upon the environmental condition. If you go and clip uh, um, a leaf level instrument that at the leaf level, this is a transpiration rate at the leaf level, this top right graph, and transpiration at uh, elevated CO2 and the ambient CO2 under wide range of uh, temperature conditions here, we, when we monitor at a wide range of temperature condition, you can see that they are not going parallel one-to-one -one ratio. They are plants grown at elevated CO2. Uh, they, the stomates are being closed partially. That reduce, reduces the stomatal opening that causes uh, plants will lose at the leaf level to a certain extent, a, a little bit less water. But when we look at the sea, these are these these things are important. If you look at the uh, spot level, you impose treatment today, and then look at uh, you will see that kind of things in even at the canopy level. But if you grow the plants for the whole season, the responses are much different. Here we are looking at the canopy transpiration, a whole plant, whole canopy, like a whole meter square um, water loss at uh, transpiration at elevated CO2 on the y-axis transpiration at the ambient CO2 on the x-axis and they go one to one line. That means the decrease in leaf level, transpiration level is not there when we look at the whole plant, whole plant level. The reason for that one is this lower transpiration rate at the leaf level are being compensated when you look at the leaf ambient CO2 leaf area at the ambient level, leaf area at elevated CO2, there is about a 25% increase in leaf area. That uh, increase in leaf area compensates the decrease in stomatal conduction at the leaf level. And the net result is plants use almost the same amount of, same amount of uh, water, but water use efficiency is much greater at elevated CO2 to, to a certain extent because they lose the same amount, they produce more biomass. So we looked at the gas exchanges, and then I wanted to show you some examples of um, <clears throat> on growth and development as a function of environmental stresses. Here I intend um, I, I took a liberty of showing the other crop species here uh, seed germination. The pink pink line is cotton, the the green is soybean. The blue line is corn. Three of the major summer summer grown crops here at Mississippi State. 
cotton seed germination is very temperature sensitive. And then here we are looking at seedling emergence as a function of temperature. And then seedling emergence also declines with increase in temperatures and means it takes more time at a low temperature compared to the elevated temperature, elevated temperature conditions to a certain extent. So the issue here is um, if we need cold tolerance to a certain extent in some regions like in the US, because the crop, when, when we grow crop, when we seed the crop, the temperatures are invariably um, are very close to the minimum level, minimum or just above the minimum for cotton around 15 degrees or uh, about 15 to 18 degrees when we, when we plant it. But in this other regions, the temperatures may be a little warmer than, warmer than here. So the cotton is very sensitive to both extremes, both extremes. So de developing some sort of uh, seed germination, seed early seedling vigor, both the cold and heat tolerance is needed to a certain extent. Looking at a very early season growth, again, you can see that uh, these are three week old cotton plants. Three week old cotton plants. You can see these uh, plants going at a very low temperatures are showing almost, um, they stayed at uh, two leaf stages, one to two leaf stages for about three weeks. At the very high temperatures, the optimal temperature is around here, at very high temperatures, again, slightly decline. Similar to the shoot growth, root growth is also very sensitive to, to, to certain extent. We have been screening some varieties and uh, some other uh, chromosome substitution lines um, for variability in shoot growth and also variability in, uh, um, variability in root growth to certain extent. Uh, we, haven't, I, I'm, um, we haven't completely analyzed it. We need a lot of varieties are there, a lot of lines are there. It takes a lot of effort to screen those things uh, for low and high temperature tolerance or uh, early seedling growth. Looking at um, uh, how the leaves and the flower buds are added on the main stem and also on the fruiting branches, here we are looking at um, uh, how the leaf as a function of temperatures. You can see this um, at a very high temperature, it takes less time compared to the low temperatures, adding a leaf on the main stem. These adding leaves and add, adding flower birds goes hand in hand to a certain extent. These are adding leaves on the fruiting branches. So typically fruiting branches, it takes more time to add a leaf on a fruiting branch. Um, <clears throat> that uh, those details, it, it takes a lot more time to explain it because each um, branch it terminates into a, um, a flower, flower bird and then the meristem grows from the axle of the leaf and then it takes again grows and then terminates again. So it forms some sort of a zigzag pattern. Uh, for that reason it takes more time to add a, a leaf on the, um, on the fruiting branches compared to add a leaf on the main stem. So change small change in temperature at, at this level are not makes that much difference, but at the cold temperature, it makes a lot more difference. And uh, looking at this uh, leaf area expansion and stem elongation as a function of temperature, and then yeah, the optimal temperature is around 28 degrees, and then both of them, it, uh, the there is a linear response up to that 28 degree mark, both for leaf area expansion and also stem elongation. Elevated CO2 to a certain extent, if the CO2 is there, it is going to add some more advantages. So there is about 10% um, increase in plant height. About node addition rates are not that much, almost like a main stem node addition rates are not that much. Leaf area is about 26% more, branch length, is al almost like a 43% more, and fruiting sites about 32% more under elevated CO2. Root growth, not much investigated, but a very few studies, and uh, there's not that much uh, information available to make a, to, to make a um, comment on that one. And then we are looking at um, how major developmental rates um, mostly controlled by temperature. Here we are looking at uh, emergence to square from here to here, and the square that uh, that the tiny square 
that turns into a flower from here to this stage and then from flower to mature cotton fruit. So three major phenological events, major developmental events, days between events here as a function of temperature, these are all controlled by temperature condition to a certain extent. There are, there are two, two things, the time intervals decreases with increase in temp temperature and then slightly increases at, uh, at high temperatures here for square formation and also for square to flower time interval. Whereas the time interval between flower to open fruit decreases with increase in temperature almost linearly, almost linearly. So change in temperatures, change in temperature either due to future climatic condition will have a lot of effect on on, the, on this um, time interval from flower to open fruit. So that will, if uh, temperatures goes up, then the, the time interval, the sh you'll have, will have a shorter interval that makes it the bowls will be uh, smaller through bowls will be produced at high temperature to certain extent. So that's what we are looking here. Um, fruit weight or bowl weight here as a function of temperature, both the ambient and elevated mostly controlled by genetic factors um, to a certain extent and modified by environmental stress conditions. Here, the CO2 has a very little effect, but uh, temperature has a large effect with, uh, with, in with increase in temperature, the bowl size is declining. And then if you look at the growth rates of these organs from here to here, from here to here, and you can see the rate of growth, the optimum temperature varies for each of those organs. This is the, for the flower development. This is for the fruit development. The optimum temperature is around 24, 25 degrees. For square development, the optimum temperature is around 30, 32 degrees. And then the growth response, of fruit growth response to temperature is very critical. Any change in temperature will have a drastic effect on, on fruit growth um, because it declines linearly at high temperatures starting from 25 degrees. Here, uh, I'm presenting again this one. This uh, one particular experiment is very unique in the sense I have shown you earlier the photosynth photosynthetic response. We did a very nice experiment, similitude experiments, what we call it. We controlled uh, one chamber based on 1995 ambient temperature conditions, planting at the same time what we typically plant here at Mississippi. These are 1995 ambient ambient uh, temperature conditions. And then we change the other, ch other chamber, plus, plus two degrees to 1995, plus five degrees, plus seven degrees, minus two degrees to 1995. And then we are looking at here, vegetative biomass, grams per plant, at the plants grown at ambient CO2 is the red one, plants grown at elevated CO2 is the green one. As you can see that plants grown at elevated CO2 has additional, um, produces more greater photosynthesis that in turn results in more vegetative biomass across a wide range of temperature condition. Similarly, the fruiting, uh, fruiting sites, number of fruiting sites produced across uh, temperature condition, plants grown at elevated CO2 produce more fruiting sites. And if once we come to the retention side, and then plants grown at um, both the ambient and ele elevated CO2 conditions, they could only produce fruiting retained bowls only up to 1995 plus two degrees only, beyond two degrees for diurnal and seasonal changes in temperature compared to 1995. None of them produce uh, retained bowls. That is due to they produce lots of lots of fruiting sites, lots of flowers were formed. Within two, three days they were on the ground because they 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 lost most of the loss is due to pollen abnormalities. Pollen um, quality of the pollen was not good. So the fertilization process was affected. In the net result is almost like zero zero, zero fruits at the at 1995 and 90 plus five and plus seven degrees. So in other words, it, at US Mid-South, if we have, it can only tolerate plus two degrees, only plus two degrees temperature. Beyond that, it is kind of uh, the fruit production 
uh, fruit retention will be much more affected to, um, in we we did see this one not only in this particular experiment but in other experiments as well, as well in other other studies at high temperature to certain extent so if you look at the food production efficiency the optimal temperature for food production efficiency is around 28 degrees 27 degrees and then it decreases uh, 10 percent with one degree increase in temperature from that one to and almost goes to zero degree zero fruit production efficiency around 33 degrees centigrade so here i wanted to point out that these are almost goes hand in hand with the canopy temperature to certain extent so there is about a 10 percent decrease for each degree increase in temperature from the optimum from 27 degrees this is almost similar to many other crops to a certain extent. The optima varies depending upon the species. For rice, it's around 22 degrees, but uh, there is about 10% decrease in uh, grain yield for rice also, similar to this one. But the optima varies depending upon the species. Here are some field work. It is uh, done by Dr. one of my uh, friends, uh, Glenn Ritchie from Texas Tech, where they have the ability to control the water to a certain extent because of the smaller amount of rainfall they receive it. So the, here we are looking at the cumulative irrigation and precipitation combined together, uh, millimeters here and link yield and different years, they almost decline with uh, lower amounts of uh, irrigation and precipitation patterns. The optimum is here, somewhere here for many of them. It, uh, there is a year to, uh, <clears throat> there is interaction between year and uh, the interaction is not there, but the year to year variation is there due to um, <clears throat> maybe other other aspects related to uh, radiation loads and you know, some other aspects related in that particular re region. So <clears throat> what we have seen is uh, I have. Dr. Premalata, Dr. Premalata, please mute. Dr. Premalata, please mute yourself. Caroline, can we do it? Caroline, can we mute this Dr. Premalata? So we are having a bit of an issue with that right now. Blame it, Martin. Blame it, change. Sorry, Dr. Reddy, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so if you could please uh, find uh, one of our um, pictures, like ICSC pictures in the participants, uh -huh. and uh, click on the three dots at the top. Yeah. And make one of uh, us a, a host because somehow you received the you are the host right now, so we need to take the controls from you. Oh. Just if you see a picture that says ICAC and one yes. participant, uh, if you hover you. over it. There's going to be uh, another button with three dots. Yes, it's a make. Click on make that. Me. Is there an option that says make host? Yes. If you can click on that, please. Thank yes. you so much. Okay, it's it's all good now. Thank you, Doctor. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so we looked at um, um, the environmental stresses. I, I particularly presented temperature and also the, the water stress effect. So we have to looking at physiology and photosynthesis and uh, looking at the growth and development. There's uh, two components. One of them is increasing the potential for cotton photosynthesis is one aspect. And then the second aspect is um, for at the seed level, we need to have both cold tolerance and also heat tolerance. At the um, reproductive level, we need a lot more heat tolerance um, because the pollen is the most sensitive to, to changes in temperature condition, particularly at high temperature, including even in the current condition to a certain extent, we lose a lot of fruit when the temperatures are above the critical limit, even in certain years here at Mississippi State, even uh, here as well. Now we are looking at some aspects of the, uh, similar aspects of um, looking at fiber quality to a certain extent. 
we did this one too one of the older varieties is, is a texas marker one because we that is one of the molecular standards so we wanted to have that one investigated on all aspects of environmental stresses on that particular uh, variety so that it can uh, the data can be utilized in both molecular uh, people and also for, for physiology people. For modeling purpose, you can take this one and then modify based on the other varieties. The response functions will be similar, but the potential will be different for modern varieties to a certain extent. Small potential differences will be there. As you can see, this fiber length, um, uh, length, um, strength is strength, length, micronair, and uh, uniformity and also the short fiber content, those are the four or five major components that are very important. Strength is one of the, one of the um, most important one among all the fiber quality traits. And in, you can see this uh, optimal temperature for many of those traits vary depending upon the trait and also, and um, particularly at the high temperatures, length dec decreases and micronair changes from optima on either side and then fiber strength almost like a declines with uh, lower temperatures and at high temperatures it's not changing that much. Fiber uniformity, optima temperature is around 24 and declines on either side. Similar trends were observed um, for drought stress, fiber length on the top left hand and then the fiber strength here, and then micronair here, and then fiber uniformity. And also here, um, well watered on, the, on this side, and um, less well watered and water stressed on this side. Well watered in, the, in this um, plants, midday leaf water potential shows around here. Um, so this, uh, this data set is particularly very uh, important. There are two components, one of them is uh, water leaf water status which is a very dynamic process and the other aspect is fiber growth and development is also a very dynamic process it takes longer period of time almost like 55 to 60 days here at mississippi uh, in mississippi to a certain extent so the water stress during that um, time frame changes on a daily basis so we have to find a ways and then the means to quantify this one so it is a kind of technique that uh, we developed here to quantify those two important dynamic processes for, for modeling purpose. Many of the models for, for now, this is a very recent work we published in 2013 um, uh, onwards, uh, several aspects of fiber quality as a function of environmental stresses. Many of the crop models do not have this fiber quality module uh, um, subroutines in, in the model, they have only Yield, yield levels, but not fiber quality to a certain extent. So the quality is also very important. We are currently looking at some aspects of fiber quality and also some other environmental stresses of um, uh, on some of the chromosome substitution lines. I will come to the next one, that one, looking at the variability. Um, we did some a field level evaluation about 38 cotton cultivars that are commonly grown in the U.S. Mid-South. And then we developed a physiological traits, a suite of physiological traits and a suite of reproductive traits, and then classified them for some sort of an index, it means that we, are, we assigned a value to each and every cultivar that are grown in the U.S. Mid-South from the field, um, that are grown in the field using that physiology and also reproductive tra traits, and then classify them, see what kind of variability that we can get among the existing cultivars. You can see that um, reproductive traits, there is some variation, physiological traits, there is a small variation is there. Very few cultivars are classified, the red ones are um, more uh, uh, heat tolerant, and then the blues are less heat tolerant, the greens are in between, majority of them are, are in, in between kind of traits, in, in between varieties in terms of heat tolerance. And we also did uh, very recently looked at um, with uh, working with uh, Dr. Johnny Jenkins here at Mississippi State and Sukumar Saha and also <clears throat> working uh, um, on chromosome substitution lines um, so we found some an interesting 
interesting um, trend. Well, what we found is when we classified similar uh, several lines using chromosome substitution lines, and we found that the many of these straight values used in that analysis were a little greater than what we observed in the you know, regular, regular cultivars here. Similar trends we observed for drought tolerance. We classified them again for drought. We have very few, very few of them are in, a, in the drought tolerant category. Uh, it is very important. You can see that very few lines are there and the variability is also very less. Uh, either physiological terms or reproductive terms, very less. And then we also found the similar kind of thing on the chromosome substitution line to a certain extent. The, the trait values used, uh, found in those were slightly greater than what we observed in the uh, regular varieties here. So there is a way, there may be a, some, some sort of uh, um, uh, interest or maybe, maybe look into the trait values in the, uh, some sort of uh, heat tolerance or cold tolerance uh, or drought tolerance in those lines and see whether that could be incorporated into the upland cotton varieties to a certain extent. <clears throat> so with that, uh, um, I thank you for the opportunity to present my work. Um, uh, many, many students, many grad students, many visiting scientists contributed for the success of my program here at Mississippi State. I, I am indebted to all of them um, over years. Uh, the USDA here, um, when I joined here uh, with a wonderful group of crop models, modelers, they helped me understand the whole plant physiology. I'm really uh, grateful for them um, for that opportunity when I came here early on. And we have this, um, what we call it as a sunlit plant growth chamber facility. It is a, one of the two facilities in the country one of the fascinating facility that I have ever worked with. Um, I, it um, allows us to do, conduct experiments, something that we cannot do it in, other way, um, in any other um, facilities to understand the both leaf level and the canopy level plant processes to a certain extent that will be useful not only for breeders, but also for modelers that can be used uh, uh, on the uh, production environment, but also help in making the policy decision to a certain extent. And also finally, I thank um, um, the ICAC for giving me the opportunity to present my work. And I'm, <coughs> I'm really thankful for here. Uh, I'm sharing the next talk with my, um, I never met him, but Mike, <laughs> he, we co-authored a few publications and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to share with him uh, the, today's presentation to a certain extent. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Reddy, and thank you uh, very much indeed for sharing a very interesting and comprehensive presentation. Uh, there has been a lot of questions in the chat, so I'm going to get straight into those questions for you. So from uh, Mohammed Akhtar Ruznaman um, in Bangladesh, He's, he asked, he says, in Bangladesh we are facing challenges of very low seed germination due to increased rainfall in sowing time in the months of July and August. Is there any technology to ensure seed germination to maintain optimum plant population? Well, <clears throat> Mm. This is a field level question that we are asking is um, uh, cotton seed germination early emergence is very sensitive to environmental conditions, uh, particularly temperature and also flooding level. Um, we started in, um, for if it is a flood level, razor beds is one of the options um, in the field condition. Razor beds so that it um, water will recede to a certain extent. Um, other than that, um, hmm, one of the technique is, uh, that's a long-term objective is uh, developing uh, tolerance level or the seed level to a certain extent, looking at the parental environment. Um, 
effects on seed quality and then further seed germination and seedling growth to a certain extent. We have been doing that some work on that other crops, but uh, we haven't done a whole lot of work on parental environmental effects on seed quality and then further in the next generational um, seed germination and seedling growth effect implications to a certain extent. Um, Raised beds is one of them, one of the options to a certain extent in those um, flooded conditions. High temperatures, um, I guess it's a mo the moisture level to a certain extent, the, the interaction between moisture and temperature will make a lot of difference. Thank you. Um, one from Giant Meshram. Wild cotton species may offer new sources of novel traits for heat and drought tolerance. Is there any work in this area? <clears throat> yes, we, we started recently. We have started um, uh, particularly looking at, at the chromosome substitution lines um, uh, from incorporating into upland cotton varieties that are developed by USDA here and Texas A&M. <clears throat> uh, and then we are testing those things for high temperature, low temperature, and drought and uh, drought tolerance to a certain extent. We, we have started very recently evaluating those lines. We find uh, some of those from Comitosum, for example, T04, one of my friends here at Mississippi State, Dr. Sukumar Saha and his colleagues. <clears throat> we found that uh, one of those varieties has, um, some of those lines have a, a little bit more heat tolerance than regular varieties that um, uh, compared to the regular lines. So like a TM1, which is upland cotton variety. So those chromosome substitution lines coming from wild species uh, has a potential, not only wild, but also gossiping barbudans to a certain extent, has the potential to have heat and drought tolerance to a certain extent. More, more studies are needed in that, in that area to a certain extent. Thank you. Thank you. And can I just remind everyone to keep their microphones to mute unless you're actually speaking. Um, one from Lucika Wazilawa. Um, how can salinity be handled now there is a push towards irrigation by the Kenyan government? Do you have any comments on that? Uh, <clears throat> we just concluded one... Uh, um, we haven't done a whole lot of, uh, I haven't done personally a whole lot of salinity work. We just uh, looked at uh, one recent experiment, uh, looking at uh, four different uh, crop species, soybean, sorghum, uh, cotton, um, and wheat. Among all the varieties, uh, species we tested, the, there is a decrease in, with increase in salinity, but the decrease, um, the soybeans were most sensitive, followed by sorghum to a certain extent. I was surprised, but um, wheat and cotton seems to be tolerant to more of those. So those studies are needed uh, systematically at different growth stages. We haven't done a whole lot of work, but uh, that is uh, uh, salinity screening is needed for a majority of the varieties and also the um, <clears throat> that that will uh, help provide some information for the breeders to develop um, tolerant varieties to sal salinity to a certain extent. Much, I haven't done much work in that area. We just started one, one experiment very recently. Thank you. Um, one from Om Tuteja. In the northern states of India, germination is adversely affected due to high temperatures between 45 to 47 degrees. Um, small rains lead to crust formation, again affecting germination. Can you suggest some solutions? Um, <clears throat> solutions for germination. <clears throat> it's a tough question. <laughs> uh, uh, <clears throat> the, I, I'm, I, for particularly for temperature, it's, uh, there are not that many solutions to a certain extent, uh, except um, um, making the soil, top soil a little bit cooler than normal is a um, no-till and mulching kind of 
approaches that uh, decreases the soil temperature to certain extent. Other than that, I, long term strategy will be developing heat tolerant uh, seed, uh, looking at parental parental environment where the best seed can be produced that can sustain at uh, a little bit higher temperatures than normal. Uh, we did some experiments with other crop species that shows that uh, seed that is produced at uh, less than optimum conditions, more than optimum condition are less are susceptible to any kind of environmental uh, adversity or environmental stress effects, either temperature drought or uh, low or high temperature to a certain extent. Those studies are not yet been um, uh, fully studied in cotton. Parental environmental um, environmental factors at the parent and then looking at uh, subsequent quality, seed quality and also further seedling growth, uh, those studies are not being addressed. So one thing is uh, it looks like the quality, seed quality that we get in the bag, the, it, um, where it is produced it makes some difference. So the seed quality, where it comes from, its parental environmental conditions, based on that we have to select the varieties um, for adverse condition to a certain extent. Those studies are not being fully um, investigated to a certain extent. Okay, thank you. Um, there is a, a question from Amadou Guerre. Um, it is in French, and um, as everyone knows, my French is really, really bad, so I hope I'm translating this correctly. Um, but um, um, the question is, does there exist a variety of cotton that can adapt to temperatures between 40 to 45 degrees? Mm. And, and if I've got that wrong, somebody please shout. Okay. And there's also a related question from Adriana from FAO. She says, we need to improve studies to identify cotton varieties that could support high temperatures, especially in Latin America, the investigation is very less. So I think both questions are related. Yes, I, I, left, I left that one because it was a comment, um, but, that's, but thank you for raising that. Um, <clears throat> the, <clears throat> the variability in heat tolerance among the varieties are very little to a certain extent. As far as you know, there's a small variability is there by, among the ex existing upland varieties. Um, the Pima cotton or the Gossipium barbadans lineage, even though it is grown in um, uh, Arizona and uh, high temperature environment, uh, in a desert, desert well water condition, the canopy temperatures are much cooler than the air temperatures in that, in that part of the world. For that reason, it sustains and produces well to a certain extent, but it is more, uh, less heat tolerant than the upland varieties to a certain extent. Even though it is uh, more modern upland Pima cotton varieties are bred to be um, more heat tolerant, but relatively less um, tolerant uh, than upland varieties to a certain extent when we tested in the common environment. Um, among the existing varieties, there I, I, I don't think there is a standout variety that um, performs very well under very high temperature conditions for now. The majority of the varieties are, um, they fail because of the pollen related issues. It is not the growth. Growth is slightly different than the growth survival is much different. The pollen is much more sensitive to high temperatures. <coughs> so uh, <laughs> we, uh, we are seeing some variability um, for heat tolerance coming from those other species that are incorporated into that um, uh, upland varieties here using chromosome substitution lineage kind of breeding strategies. But uh, I, haven't, I, I don't think I have, um, I can recommend any variety that is a heat tolerant for now based on my work or my experience. <laughs> they all go down well, once they reach that critical uh, more than the critical temperatures. Thank you. Uh, from Poonam Monga, 
uh, abiotic stresses in rain-fed regions in India are the major cause of productivity stagnation and fluctuations. Can you advise uh, two to three major thrust areas of research as a priority? One of them is, um, um, first of all, we need to know the variability among the existing varieties, existing varieties and lines, variability for heat tolerance, variability for drought, both of them are a combination of those two things. Um, the, one of them is once we know the screening, screening techniques, um, we had to use a pollen as the one of the criterion to um, make heat tolerance. For drought, pollen is not the criteria, but the other, other physiological traits are there for drought. For heat, pollen has to be part of, part of that one. Maybe there's some correlation will be there, some physiological to pollen, but I haven't seen that much. Except using pollen, there is no other way of developing a technique that can classify the lines or varieties for heat tolerance. That's one of the areas. The other areas is, um, <clears throat> Looking at the parental environmental effects on seed quality and, uh, and then further into seed germination and uh, seedling growth. That will give some clues where we can produce the best quality seed. So seed produced across the, across the all growing areas are not going to be um, that, that good. This is um, what we recently found in other species like soybean is um, you can produce best quality seed based on the um, temperature conditions. Um, so this area is good for seed quality that can be for industry purpose. For this area, maybe not that good. So that quality parental environmental effects on seed and further seed quality and then further seedling growth is another area that is uh, absolutely needed. Uh, research to a certain extent. Thank you. Uh, from V. Kumar, uh, what will be the combined effect of uh, levitated CO2 and temperature as the latter will influence soil moisture, microbial activity and disease and pests? <laughs> That's a mouthful for me to answer. <laughs> there are a lot of, <laughs> lot of uh, things combined together. So the um, as far as the heat tolerance is concerned, the pollen related issue is carbon independent. Means nothing to do with carbon. Means you know, whether you grow in the elevated CO2 or ambient CO2, once plants reaches the crosses that cross um, optimum temperature, then the decline is carbon independent. The pollen related issues are carbon independent. So it's nothing to do with the carbon elevated CO2 to a certain extent. There may be a small change in temperature for plants grown at elevated CO2, that small change is very small. So not to worry about that much, that much. but ambient temperature, once crosses the, opti the optimal temperature, then everything goes down. Uh, for uh, drought, there is an added advantage for plants grown at elevated CO2. Uh, to a certain extent, across wide range of temperature, uh, wide range of dirt condition to a certain extent. Thank you. Uh, from Asif Mahmood, um, he uh, talks at slide uh, number 31, it's obvious that all the fiber quality parameters are showing the same pattern and decrease after a certain temperature. Um, what um, is recommended to retain fiber quality, the fiber quality potential of cotton? Well, obviously the temperature we cannot change except uh, there is a small uh, window of opportunity for planting, ad adopt, adopting planting zones to certain um, planting times. That's the only one for a given location. Uh, temperature you cannot change. Obviously there is a huge uh, management issues related to uh, variety selection is one. Um, um, beyond that, um, uh, once variety is selected, Beyond that is uh, temperature and temper uh, water. If we have water resources, irrigation is one of them. And the other one is fertilization, including all those um, major nutrients to a certain extent. You can make changes uh, because all of those factors affect similarly. Uh, nitrogen, potassium, um, um, 
affects similarly all the straight parameters, including water. So obviously temperature, we cannot make anything except small window for opportunity for planting planting that in certain region, not in every region, but certain region you can adjust planting dates. Um, in order to do that in our regions, we have to plant a little early that goes into the colder, clim cold, cooler, cooler climatic conditions. That means we need a cold tolerance to certain extent. Uh, that will be a little bit more advantageous uh, in our region, but in other regions, uh, the cold tolerance is not that big issue. Heat tolerance may be the big issue in the other regions. So for quality issues, um, water, managing water resources and managing fertilizer resources is a key point um, to a certain extent. Okay, thank you. Um, a very easy question from Venu. Are the values on the x-axis of the graphs daily mean temperatures or maximum temperatures? Those are average temperatures for day-night average temperatures. All the graphs that I showed are average temperatures. Good. I, just, I knew that one would be easy one to answer. Um, then from uh, Mohammed Akhtar Ruzaman again. Um, are there in, are there climate changes that have uh, an effect on the length of cotton crop duration? Well. Obviously, the major factor is the temperature. Um, so any changes in temperature conditions will have uh, growing season will be altered. Um, how much depends on how much change is projected for a given location. Um, so the growing season is only will be altered based on the ambient temperature conditions. So any changes in temperature obviously will affect that one. Um, I, I think, think this is, a, that's all it is, it's yes. the temperature conditions. Any, any changes in projected temperatures uh, will have an effect, as I showed uh, in the slides, the squaring information, square to flower in time intervals, emergence to square, square to flower in, is not that much change due to changes in temperature, small changes there. But flowering to fruit maturity, bowl opening is almost linearly declined with increase in temperature. That makes um, changes in temperature makes a lot more effect on those particular event. That means if the window is shorter, you get smaller balls and then obviously you'll get the less yields uh, under high temperature conditions. Thank you. And from Dr. Tabib uh, from the Cotton Development Board in Bangladesh, what will be the physiological fate um, of the cotton plant under low light cloudy situations? Low light cloudy situations. Um, I guess it's a low light is either due to in the field level or either due to uh, day lengths shorter day lengths are cloud cover um, in the field conditions. Obviously it will have, <clears throat> the one I showed is the, the maximum potential as a function of radiation and photosynthesis is almost like linear at um, to a certain extent, beyond certain level it uh, saturates because other factors are coming and playing. So increasing that potential is, um, is one aspect. Uh, either introducing something similar to C4 um, kind of syndrome to C3, but um, at the field level, except it decreases the, um, the amount of photosynthesis, I don't see any other option. Uh, it just decreases canopy level photosynthesis uh, at low light levels. Okay, thank you. Uh, just uh, an observation from Dr. Shazad from Pakistan. Um, he says, for the last five years, we are facing high temperatures and unexpected heavy rains. This year, 2020, we experienced high temperatures coupled with high humidity, which reduced the production to 
High rainfalls also affect the seed quality and affect germination here too. Um, then I have a question from Michel Foch. Um, transplanting seedlings obtained in nursery could be a way to overcome the issue of bad seed germination in field. Uh, that is a possibility. Uh, <laughs> that is a possibility, but uh, uh, transplanting large swaths of cotton in many industrialized <laughs> countries, um, you need technology to do that. <laughs> okay. And uh, a comment from um, Dr. Banj, uh, Dr. Schimming, who in Australia is screening for salinity, sodicity, tolerance, and having success and he gives a link to his uh, publication on that work in the chat. Um, from Sabesh in India, is there any idea of duration of crop to escape from high temperature periods, either advancing or prolonging the sowing date? I... Can we put the microphones on mute, please? <clears throat> well, obviously, the temperature, any change in temperature, either nighttime or daytime, <clears throat> or day night temperatures, they all have, once reach the critical temperatures, then it doesn't matter whether it's a change in nighttime temperature or change in day night temperatures or change in small change in nighttime temperatures will have the same effect. <clears throat> they all goes to, uh, at a moderately high temperature, it goes both pollen and also carbohydrate stress. At an extremely high temperature, it goes to mostly goes to pollen, pollen related aspects. <clears throat> okay, thank you. And from Satish Sain in, uh, at the CICR in India, does the soil organic carbon and soil aeration help decrease the soil temperature? <clears throat> that is not my area, but uh, I'm guessing I'm going to uh, mean uh, soil organic carbon. Um, I don't think I have an answer. I'm not an expert. I do not have expertise in that area, but any, anything that has mulching, those aspects will have will lower the soil temperature to a certain extent. But uh, I'm, I haven't seen I have anything that relates to exactly soil carbon content, except debris that is there on the top of the soil uh, that makes the difference. I haven't seen it. I'm, I do not have, um, I'm not the right person. Maybe. Thank you, Dr. Reddy, and let me now introduce our next speaker, Dr. Michael Banj, who was the former chief scientist at uh, CSIRO in Australia. So like uh, Dr. Reddy, uh, Dr. Banj is also a, um, a globally acclaimed scientist um, and a, a global research leader on the impact of climate change on cotton and management, and he has led for 25 years, cotton research in initiatives into abiotic stress tolerance, climate change impacts and adaption, cotton systems and water use efficiency. His own research included detailed investigations into the impacts of climate and management on cotton fiber quality, use of novel plant growth regulators and the con consequences of agronomy and management on textile performance. He is now a senior manager in the Australian Grains Research and Development Corporation, supporting investment into agronomy, soils, nutrition, and farming systems. So welcome, Dr. Banj, and um, let's get straight into it. Over to you. I hope, yes, I was hoping he's still there. <laughs> I, I am everyone and I, I haven't fallen asleep. Hello, hello everyone from Australia. Is everyone, um, can you see my presentation and I will go to... Yes, can see it. yeah. You can make it a full screen, Dr. Bunch, yes. 
And is it in the presentation mode or is it still sharing two slides? It's two it's slides. How is that? Is that one? Yes. Perfect. One? Perfect. Well, well, hello everyone from Australia. Um, Keshav was was correct. It is uh, now one one a.m. in Australia, and I've uh, in, in I've been I'm wide awake and have enjoyed uh, Dr. Reddy's presentation. He 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 made one mistake in his presentation, um, in that he he has actually met me uh, twenty five years ago. I was a young scientist uh, and was probably one of many uh, many visitors to uh, uh, Dr. Reddy's facility and. Uh, it was it was it was that visit to that facility that inspired me to uh, bring some of the approaches and thinking that uh, Dr. Reddy and his team were taking uh, around climate change and implement them in Australia. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, thank everyone for the opportunity to present, and uh, and I'd also like to uh, acknowledge uh, uh, Dr. Reddy's. Uh, uh, award, uh, the ICAC award. Uh, I, I certainly uh, support the uh, incredible work that he's done and the, much of the physiology and the science that he has undertaken has underpinned uh, much of the knowledge and insights uh, into climate change uh, around the world for cotton. So my, my talk is a little bit different from uh, Dr. Reddy's in the sense that I'll be talking a little bit more about uh, issues that relate to the management implications and challenges relating to climate change. So I'll attempt to maybe answer some of, oh, uh, some of the hard questions that uh, Dr. Reddy was uh, being faced with uh, around some of the things that we, we've been attempting to undertake uh, in Australia and working with some colleagues in, in the USA uh, in that sense. So one one of the things that I will will uh, highlight is that in Australia we we have a uh, a cotton production system that is uh, what we consider very high input. I, so t noting that just that some of these some of the discussions here have to be tempered by the fact that we we do use a lot more water and a lot more nitrogen on our crops and grow uh, quite high yielding crops. But in, in essence. The, the principles are, are relatively the same, no matter no matter whether the crop is grown in Australia or elsewhere in the world. Uh, I am going to talk about some of my own thoughts about how we meet some of these these challenges that we face. It's certainly truly a snapshot. Uh, I have have I've, have limited time and certainly cannot talk about all the management approaches and and concepts that need to be considered in in addressing climate change. I actually noticed in the chat that there were, there were some questions relating to pest management uh, and diseases. And uh, I, as, an, as a research agronomist, I, I won't be uh, delving into, into those aspects and leave that for somebody else to address another day. But just acknowledging that, you know, I'm not um, actually addressing all elements of the system. And my presentation today is decidedly crop focused. So I, I'm talking about things very much uh, approaches and thinking that we've taken to the field. Dr. Reddy covered uh, many of the challenges that, uh, that are faced uh, in countries across the world and uh, those challenges are no different in Australia. Uh, certainly the, the challenge that we face in Australia, much more than many other countries, is that we are the, uh, the driest continent on the earth. And uh, what, as a consequence of that, we have a heavy emphasis on ins uh, ensuring that we uh, use our water to the best possible means that we can. Uh, and that's probably the one aspect of climate change that scares us the most. I'm gonna broadly, I've broadly grouped some of the strategies uh, that we look to undertake and address climate change. And if I was giving this presentation on any other day, they, there would be the same probably strategies that we'd use to, to uh, look to grow efficient and, and profitable crops. Uh, so I'll try, these are the strategies that are under these headings. So, you know, the, the target of main, increasing and maintaining yields is, is something we look to attain. Improving production efficiencies, things like nitrogen and water. We, we use concepts of adaptive management, noting that we, we grow cotton 
uh, in, in a variable and both changing environment. Uh, we look to harness the variability that exists out there uh, and, and try to embrace that to try to drive our, our, our thinking and uh, efficiencies. And very much, and it's something that uh, Dr. Dr. Reddy was emphasising that one of the challenges that we do have with climate change, uh, not unlike any of our production, is that uh, when we're looking at these problems, they're, they're not single dimensional, they're multifaceted, uh, and we have to look at systems approaches to, to address the problems that we face. I will just sort of recognise that you know this, what some of the work that I'll be presenting today is 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 a result of uh, uh, a collaborative effort between uh, many colleagues in Australia and in, in the USA. Uh, we we would have loved to build um, spa facilities in in Australia, uh, and yet we couldn't. Uh, we we have a combination of uh, glasshouse work. Uh, in-field facilities where we control temperature and CO2 and we've used cedar chambers which are uh, a smaller and less refined version of, of, of some of these facilities. It's using these facilities in combination that we, we try to gain some insights on, on our climate change effects. And talk a little bit now how some of the approaches and thinking that we are considering around improving yield. A few years back, uh, Dr. Greg Constable and, and I published a paper around uh, what were what were the things that were needed to drive the potential yield in cotton. And you know, we we estimated if you if everything was was growing right, you have a long growing season, you could you could grow crops up to uh, three thousand kilograms plus of lint per hectare, which are were quite are quite high. And we are actually even seeing crops in Australia actually starting to reach some of those potentials. So uh, we may have to reset some of that potential in, in that sense. And that's that is a consequence of having plenty of water, plenty of nutrition and a long growing season. But we did see some challenges coming through and these are some of the things that we need to consider in, in some of our future crops. Obviously, and cotton has an indeterminate growth habit, but we'll need something with a, a relatively low fruit setting pattern um, but with that's something that generates a greater final fruit number. So the point being there is if we actually put too much, given that we're still limited in our season length, if we put fruit on still too quickly, uh, the plants tend to cut down, um, cut, sorry, cut out, and uh, we, we don't achieve yield. So we have to actually moderate the um, fruit setting. We do need to grow bigger uh, to, to, to get, uh, to translate the harvest in index that we need to, to, to get, we need a greater, greater biomass. And so therefore we need greater growth rates, we need higher and more efficient photosynthesis, and coupled with that is resilience to stress. And certainly Dr. Reddy outlined you know, those challenges and the things that we do need to overcome to allow those, those things to happen. A, a small, a, a very important thing that is often overlooked in our publication uh, but in fact, was the thing that we emphasised the most around what it takes to improve yields and, and build resilience in the system was actually a healthy, uh, a healthy and a fertile soil, and that's something that we see is is vitally important for raising production, um, not only in cotton but in, in many other crops in terms of when we're looking looking forward. We know, I noticed in the chat there was uh, a lot of uh, talk about uh, varietal development. Um, we, we see that there is still diversity to be exploited out there. We, we look at some of the comparisons. I, I, I live in, in Narrabri uh, in Australia, which is between Melbourne and, and Sydney. Uh, our average temperature in summer, um, average maximum is about 33.8. But we see that there are cottons uh, growing around Cotton growths around the world that you know experience, albeit lower yields, uh, still are able to grow um, commercially viable yields at, at, at different temperatures. One of the areas that we see and have had been have been working in is looking at uh, the more intrinsic parts of of the photosynthetic pathway, and 
one of the areas that we've targeted and seen opportunity with cotton is the role of is rubisco. Uh, Dr. Reddy referred to cotton being a C3 species and yeah, it's, its efficiency to convert, um, take CO2 from the atmosphere and convert it to carbon is much less. So we, we're trying to understand what are the underpinning mechanisms that actually where we can start to think about uh, getting cotton to function more like a C4 species. And we've already seen in the chat today about, you know, the opportunity to diverse, sorry, the opportunity to exploit and take on uh, uh, native species. Uh, we have some studies going on uh, screening uh, a range of native, native species across Australia and throughout the world. Uh, seeking that diversity in that rubisco and we, we're having some success seeing that there, there is some great opportunities there that rubisco is much more certain rubisco in some of these species is actually got much more resilience to heat. Genetic diversity um, in, and Dr Reddy referred to there are actually uh, when we've compared some old genotypes that exist uh, a delta pine variety that came to Australia uh, in the 60s versus some modern varieties. We actually, and this basically this graph says that the varieties today, while they are performing better uh, under uh, ambient and elevated CO2, what the one thing that we don't see is that there actually is no interaction uh, occurring to, to CO2 levels. And that basically highlights that, uh, that there's still opportunity there that if we can actually seek species that can take advantage of that elevated to elevated CO2, uh, there, there's an opportunity to actually uh, to improve photosynthesis. So the fact that there's no interaction between uh, genotypes that are old and new means that we still have we have opportunities to exploit that area. Dr. Reddy referred to a couple of elements that were were pretty pretty important. Uh, it was a very key slide that he talked about where you start to get, regardless of CO2 levels, uh, you start to get, uh, well, two things happen. When you've got high input, when you put plenty of water and nutrition on, you grow lots of leaf very quickly uh, at, at warm temperatures. In addition to that, when you, do, when you actually do actually experience high temperatures, you lose the fruit because of low retention. And those th two things coupled together, um, high growth rates, loss of fruit, actually cause the plant to even accelerate harder um, growing vegetative growth. So that's a real challenge in, in some of these systems where we get high temperatures occurring, uh, elevated CO2 that we, we face, and, and we're providing the plant with, um, with, with much resources. So the plants basically lose fruit, uh, self-shade, um, contribute to the loss of fruit and then there's no actually reproductive uh, demand on the crop hence we we actually accelerate the vegetative growth so that's a real uh, a challenge for where our systems where have high input where we're trying to manage the the growth of cotton um, Dr. Reddy mentioned that, that, that you know, one of the approaches is, uh, is cell membrane integrity is one way of screening um, genotypes. We've been using that approach in, approach in Australia. Uh, we see that here's an example of a graph where we've, we've taken a variety from Pakistan, uh, the one in red, and the, the graph on the right that includes Australian varieties, so the Cycala V2, the Cycot 71, has uh, Basically, the, the ones that actually are, are higher on that graph have uh, less, less cell membrane activity um, compared to the uh, Pakistan varieties. And uh, Dr. Reddy highlighted a really important thing. We, we're looking to use that as a screen te technique across uh, you know, many thousands of uh, genotypes that are, in, that are in studies. But we have to overlie that with um, solid physiological measurements that um, Dr. Reddy referred to in, in his studies, such as uh, reproductive measurements of pollen and uh, also photosynthetic measurements of, to, to measure growth. So that, that's our early screening approach looking for tolerance. I mentioned production efficiencies. Uh, 
the, the challenge that we see in the studies that we, we found is that when you do undertake integration, integration, you know, sorry, integrative uh, uh, studies of climate change, we couple high temperatures with high CO2 uh, and you even start to throw in uh, water stress. The things that we find is that uh, we start to quickly lose any of the advantages that CO2 bring when we're at certain temperatures. Uh, and in fact, we start to consume a lot of water and a lot of a lot of that is is due to that increased leaf area and loss of fruit that um, I referred to uh, uh, previously. So those plants were much bigger um, and consume a lot of water. And if they're consuming that water uh, early in crop growth, the the water is not there available later in crop growth to to grow the fruit. So we, we end up with much lower water use efficiencies. So what can you do to improve water use efficiencies? Uh, and these are the approaches that, that we've been taking in Australia. And uh, the emphasis here is that, that no one approach is going to be the, the single best approach in terms of improving water use efficiency. Uh, we are looking at obviously different alternative irrigation systems. We have heavy emphasis on scheduling irrigations using plant-based sensing um, as Dr. Reddy referred to, we're trying to improve root function and, and expansion of the rooting zone using minimum till rotations and fallows. And then a number of um, limited water management strategies, uh, util utilizing the store saw water more, avoiding excess nitrogen, using skip row configurations, moving the sowing window and shortening maturity times amongst other things. One, one area of uh, research that we've been excited about is using uh, oxygradable or biodegradable films uh, in, in different systems to try to prevent water loss uh, in the soil before we get uh, full canopy closure and uh, relatively excited about that and, and also using these these spray on polymers in uh, helping to assist um, in the germination and establishment of crops earlier on um, we can we can look to preserve the moisture uh, around the seed to give the, the, the crop the best chance of establishing uh, again I, I emphasize the, the importance of soil fertility in, in our pursuit of trying to bring crop resilience uh, under the under climate change and uh, uh, here's a study that was undertaken by Ian Rochester and shows the value of uh, using different crop rotations to improve soil, soil fertility um, and nitrogen use efficiency. So those so for those crops that were rotated with legumes, uh, we could put on much less nitrogen and we could also raise uh, the level of uh, yield being produced. Uh, our, best, our best system producing the highest yields was one that was grown uh, where a vetch crop was grown uh, with a fallow and a cotton crop together. So they were, and, and the majority of those yield improvements were not necessarily associated with the improved nitrogen from the legume, but from soil fertility, uh, increasing soil carbon and, and soil structure. We, we see a number of studies have been undertaken uh, looking to, to understand the uh, nitrogen use efficiency. Uh, similarly from Greg Constable and, and Ian Rochester, we've screened cultivars uh, over a number of years. And we see that we've improved nitrogen use efficiency, but we see um, on the graph where it refers to nitrogen use efficiency and we've circled, we see that there's some outliers that we can start to look at and start, try to understand why those particular genotypes have um, improvements in nitrogen use efficiency. And I'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end of my talk about some of the approaches we can take to uh, to, to exploit that, that variation. I mentioned about adaptive systems, uh, and this is, not, this is nothing new for cotton. Uh, cotton as a, a crop is, is one that's been more intensively managed than most other broadacre crops around the world, and has always led the way in terms of management uh, approaches, in terms of monitoring the crop. And, and having management uh, in, in the ability to actually uh, respond to those those things that are occurring during the season. Here, here I have a colleague, uh, Paxton Payton, uh, with the USDA, um, installing 
canopy temperature sensors that we're using in Oklahoma to help schedule irrigations and we're using physiology, knowledge of the physiology to actually tell us when to, to irrigate the crops. Another approach with uh, adaptive management, we're using active stress management, uh, reinvigorating the use of different plant hormones and, and plant growth regulators. Uh, this particular chemical called AVG is, is an ethylene inhibitor, inhibitor. and we've, we've, we've found that actually if we, we know that we're going to have certain stresses and we're able to get this chemical on uh, very close to that stress, we're able to prevent fruit loss and, and improve yield. And these studies were undertaken uh, in crops under waterlogged conditions. Uh, still a lot more work to do and understand these, these mechanisms or other, other uh, abiotic stresses. We've continued this work, continued work in terms of using um, standard plant growth regulators, uh, investigating, investigating the use of uh, mepiquot chloride or PICS on uh, our, our system under ambient and elevated coming out of that is that our current recommendations may around new plant growth regulators certainly may not be adequate as we move into the future climate. So um, that's essentially what the graph is saying is that the same responses to the crop in high temperature and elevated CO2 are not the same as those currently. Another another important concept to take on board, and this was introduced again in, in Dr. Uh, Reddy's presentation, is about uh, variability. And uh, one of the things that I, I think is important, noting that we variability is an opportunity. Uh, and I, I often see that one of the key approaches for, for many farming system, systems is that you, by increasing your diversity, you can start to manage that by variability. Uh, one, a recent study, um, and the message here, a recent study where I've compared cotton growing in Narrabri to a, a, a more southern area uh, and a cooler area in, in Australia uh, called Griffith. And we've, we've compared sort of temp, um, uh, day degrees or uh, thermal temperature accumulation between those places uh, over the last um, periods of 20, 40 to 60 years. The message here is really interesting. So if I compared Narrabri um, in the 1960s and 1970s, which was when modern cotton production in Australia started, the temperature in Narrabri over the cotton growing season is now the same as what it is in Griffith today as a result of, of climate change. And the message is here is that we, we now, uh, rather than trying to reinvent and invest in lots and lots of new research, we can very quickly um, start to look at different areas and try to bring the knowledge from, from Narrabri and try to implement it in Griffith, um, uh, given that there are similarities in the climate. So probably a, an argument there to you know, undertake these studies and look for those similarities so we can learn, look to learn uh, across the world in terms of you know, where we have experienced climates that we may experience in the future. Another aspect of, of managing variability uh, and where we're using, uh, using plant growth regulators uh, in Australia, in dryland cotton rain fed and dryland cotton production systems, we, we have to take advantage of when the rain falls to plant those crops. But often the rain falls too early uh, for getting the best yields because the crops, the crops, their reproductive period is growing in, in, the, in a very hot period. So we're investigating uses of things like plant growth regulators and mechanical manipulation of the crop, looking to when we, we do sow these crops knowing that they will uh, grow in, in, in the worst period. We're looking at plant growth regulators to actually delay that crop um, and, and allow them to grow in the better periods, improving water use efficiency and, and growing, growing yields. And we're having some success with certain uh, plant growth regulators and mechanical manipulation. The, the one of the final approaches I wanted to talk about is systems approaches. 
uh, the importance of you know understanding that we when we look at climate change for one we need to look at it in, a, in an integrated way uh, because looking at one one element in uh, and Dr. Reddy highlighted this on, on a number of occasions is that you you can start to look at one thing and you feel that you know one thing may be working for you but then you have to start thinking about you know temperature and water and uh, humidity and those other things that you know uh, interact to actually change the way you might get an outcome. I, I I wanted to emphasize the example of, uh, of of a system approach, and you know, we when we talk climate change, we're not just talking about you know increases in temperature and, and CO two. We're also talking about extreme climates, and uh, in Australia, this is an example. This was our climate change facility after a serious hail and windstorm, uh, and that's something we certainly have to contend with in thinking about that. So, not only our studies are taking on the effects of climate change in a broader sense. We're looking at those uh, more things like waterlogging, like looking at drought as those extreme effects. But the emphasis here is to really highlight that, uh, and I saw a lot of the questions coming up, is that you, yes, you need to look at the way the crop grows. You do need to understand the soil physical and nutritional properties of how climate change uh, and those extreme things affect but start to look at things like soil microbes and, and those other factors that can be changed as a consequence of these, of these events. Um, and we put a heavy emphasis on trying to build knowledge around these things that try to capture um, the more systems related effects in these things. I referred to the, the need to think about uh, things like nutrition use efficiency, uh, advocating very strongly for uh, research approaches are in climate change to take on board uh, using genetic by environment by management approaches. Uh, there's some great work published um, by Jerry Hatfield, um, Jerry Hatfield around what's been done in, in maize uh, in looking at genetic by environment by management approaches. And I'm sort of advocating that we, we need to look a lot harder of how we can start to develop blueprints in our cotton systems to exploit these, these interactions. Uh, the point here being is that we, when we look at uh, sourcing novel germplasm to, un, you know, to prevent abiotic stress, that we actually start the breeding teams and the agronomists and uh, system scientists working, to working closely together early on in that um, developmental phase to, to deliver those benefits much more effectively. And I'd like to think that uh, our terminology that we're using in Australia around a, a more a genetics by environment approach, um, by genetics by environment by management approach, is that we truly see this as transformational agronomy. And, and those who might be interested can see the references by a colleague by the name of John Kierkegaard in Australia. Sorry, I'll just move on. So, in summing up, uh, we, we do need to be developing um, resilient climate ready cropping systems and uh, you know some key key messages here is not to rely on any one option. We need flexibility to, to account for that variability. Um, that's my, my new mantra is diversity meets variability. Uh, some of the challenges that we need and opportunities around climate change is that we have to look at some of those other resource trade-offs so we don't ignore things uh, like the efficiencies, we'll need to do regionally specific assessments will be vital because systems and the temperatures are change. Highlighting that very much that integrative approach, um, not discounting that climate variability is still something that we need to do and taking on uh, very much transgenic and digital technologies uh, will be vital to help us deliver the benefits in the field. Uh, we need to challenge existing paradigms and the way we, we look at research and we go about research. And as I said, you know, uh, very much um, base these on systems-based approaches um, and considering other efficiencies in that. And finally, uh, just a little plug for uh, uh, some work that was sponsored by the ICAC uh, that captures um, the attempt of this publication was to capture a lot of the thinking and uh, knowledge that sits behind climate change impacts on, on cotton production. Much of Dr. Reddy's work is referred to in, in this publication 
and, and many, many experts here contributed to thinking about where and how we would undertake research um, to meet those challenges. And I'd like to acknowledge, uh, finally like to acknowledge um, my colleagues uh, from USDA, uh, Western Sydney University. A lot of this work was sponsored by the Cotton Research and Development Corporation in Australia. And I very much like to thank my former employee, um, CSIRO, um, for the, the opportunity. Thank you, everyone. And I'm happy to take questions and I will stop sharing my um, presentation now. Thank you, Dr. Banj. Um, Dr. Cranthy, I'm not sure how many minutes we've got left. Um, may I ask you if there is any questions that you think that you could pull out of the chat? Um, could you just choose one, Keshav? And uh, otherwise, I'm happy to just um, uh, make a closing statement if, uh, if we're running out of time. And I'm also conscious it is very early in the morning or very late at night for you, Michael, as well. Thanks, Kai. I mean, it is, um, it's actually interesting that there are nearly about 15 more questions, 15 or 16 more questions, and all of them are very good. So what I would suggest is, because we have a, a few more minutes, maybe about uh, uh, either 10, 15 minutes to go, um, uh, like probably we'll try to uh, take some of the important ones. But then again, as I'm going through them right now, uh, it, it, it seems to me that almost every question is important. So let's let's see how we go about. Maybe Kai, we should give it a try and then see uh, if, if there are any further remaining questions, we could uh, get in touch with the speakers and then put these questions to them. So uh, like you, you did earlier, I mean, you did a great job. So could, let's, could let's you, continue with that. Could you start off? Because I don't know where the questions for Dr. Reddy ended and, and the ones began for Dr. Ban. So if you could start off with, with, then I know where to look from. Yeah, I think uh, what I will uh, do then is, um, we'll start with uh, Dr. Subesh, uh, and probably we could leave the option to both the speakers to see as to who uh, could address these questions. I mean, not specifically because uh, I mean they like these questions relate to both presenters uh, like this question from Dr. Sabe says water availability for cotton cultivation in Australia is very minimum and being uh, world's best water use efficiency in cotton cultivation increased temperature and, uh, and evaporation would impediment cotton crop in Australia and the climate change what would be the prime approach in hand in near future to sustain cotton cultivation okay uh, well, that, that, that's, that's an easy question. There is no, uh, I think, there is no single approach. So uh, uh, the, the approach to in maintaining uh, water use efficiency and improving it is, is both a genetic, genetic approach and it's uh, very much a management approach. And I think the, the emphasis there is that we, we have a large, you know, a large emphasis in our breeding, breeding approaches looking for Temperature and 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 drought tolerance and water water use efficiency and improvements in yield, but we have uh, a very multi-pronged approach in terms of the way we address the management to improve water use efficiency. So you can improve water use efficiency by improving your soil nutrition, um, your your crop husbandry, all those sort of things. So I, I think that the 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 key message is there is to actually not take any aspect of your management for granted. You can uh, you can actually improve your yield um, and your, uh, by improving your yield by doing all your other crop management things well um, that will that will re, um, improve your water use efficiency as well so uh, easy question because there, there there isn't a, there isn't a single answer to that that question it's it's doing everything right yeah thank you Mike um, now this question is from uh, Dr. Jayant Meshram from India he's asking is there any difference in Rubisco and Rubisco activates among uh, cotton species, this I think, Dr. Reddy. Uh, well, I, yeah, you go, you go, to Dr. Reddy. <laughs> I, I, I don't think I have seen any work related to different species. Um, um, maybe that's the area that I need um, further further studies. 
Um, well, I, I, yeah. 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 Yep. Um, we, we certainly see very little diversity in the current uh, domesticated species, uh, we, uh, but we do see some diversity in the wild types. Um, and this question is from Dr. Venu. Uh, he's asking uh, about the preparedness. He says, within season, weather uh, he says, within season, weather variability is increasing. Crop faces waterlogging, uh, high temperature followed by mid-season drought, late season rains and terminal drought. Preparing for such challenges within the same crop cycle is a huge challenge. How to improve our preparedness? <clears throat> I think Mike will, um, he has more experience in that area or looking at systems approach. He will, he will be the right person to answer. It's, um, it's, there is not even a single one approach. There are multiple, um, all the approaches that are needed to utilize the resources. Mike, you, you, you're. Yeah, well, you answered that question really well. Um, Dr. Reddy, um, in the sense that yes, it's a systems approach, and I think it's a much it, it's much about understanding your system now and what what you can learn from that. But actually, understanding what the future entails, I think you know both what Dr. Reddy presented was you know using using the knowledge of the impacts of climate change uh, and start to project what the future uh, might entail and start preparing preparing for those changes very much related to that point that I was making about comparing two different two different regions that you if you know that your region is turning into uh, its climate is going to be very similar to an existing region look to go and learn from that region that has experienced those climates and those challenges before uh, there's a question from dr. Muhammad Tariq uh, he's from Pakistan he's asking is there any criteria to evaluate early detection of heat tolerance uh, of field-grown cotton. I'll, I'll, I'm going to have a go at answer. <laughs> we, we're trying. We're trying to use um, membrane integrity, and that's just a phenotyping approach. Into you know, for, to try to deal with um, mass numbers. But uh, Dr. Reddy referred to probably the most successful approach um, that exists out there is the pollen viability. That that clearly seems to be the one that that actually um, shows the most promise, uh, yet probably the hardest in terms of phenotyping. So I think, you know, we will probably look to have something that will do uh, some initial screening, things like canopy temperature or, uh, or membrane integrity to look, look for groups that might show some tolerance. But then we might have to overlay uh, some more precise measurements to over the top of that once you've found a population to really shake out uh, what might be tolerant or not. There are two questions that are slightly related, one from Dr. Fiaz Ahmed from Pakistan and the other from Dr. G. Balasuhoni, India. Uh, from Pakistan, he is asking what measures can minimize fruit shedding due to high temperatures and Balasuhoni is asking how to retain the first bloom during drought conditions. I will, uh, I think Dr. Reddy had a go at these. I think, you know, he highlighted that probably the most uh, successful means of avoiding uh, losses due to heat is probably changing your sowing time or moving that flowering window um, the best you can. Um, we, we are experimenting with, you know, use of growth regulators or mechanical manipulation to try to move that window. Uh, I, I'm not sure that there is any uh, solution to losing fruit as a result of uh, drought or water stress at the moment. It's, uh, it, in fact, in fact, sometimes uh, in many instances that relates to the indeterminate um, growth habit of the crop, that actually may be a good thing to allow you to, to actually grow uh, a crop. It, sometimes cotton losing its fruit is actually what it needs to do to grow better at a, at a, at a more appropriate time. Dr. Hassan Riaz is asking an interesting question. Uh, are there any endophytes in use to resist heat stress? I wonder if Dr. Reddy knows. I don't know of any. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not familiar with them. <laughs> um, Dr. Kategori from India is asking, hundreds of genes are known to overexpress under moisture stress to provide protection in cotton. 
do they cross talk for temperature resistance well i i my to answer that i i'm quite sure they do <laughs> and that, that, that and that that that's probably why it makes it so complex it's 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 for one it's more there's many genes involved and uh, often well if you if you actually stop and think about what water stress does it actually raises the temperatures of the leaves because the leaves are not transpiring so uh it, it is it's it's stress and it's heat working together often when you have a drought event dr abuda is asking uh, um, uh, if, if there's a possibility to use transgenic technology to solve the problem of drought stress Dr. Reddy, would you like to have a go at that one? Uh, well, we, <clears throat> we haven't studied a whole lot of uh, comparative analysis of the transgenic lines to traditional ones, but we did some work in other crops like corn, corn ma maize, and we found that um, the companies they produce like um, drought guard genes has a higher um, photosynthesis that invariably translates to its response to drought. Similar studies may be needed uh, in cotton to a certain extent, but uh, I, I don't, I haven't seen anything that is um, introduced genes in cotton that does better than normal or regular varieties, particularly for drought. <laughs> Peter, tell okay, me. Chef, I, I have an opinion on it and it may be not, uh, the, the problem with the problem with trying to seek drought stress in cotton using transgenics is that again it comes back to it will involve many many genes and uh, uh, and to actually understand which genes you would need to manipulate to in, in inflict drought stress uh, in a physiological context might be very difficult. But you but in saying that you know you may actually look to get drought tolerance through other mechanisms. So improving root growth or improving some other aspect of, of the growth. So the, uh, the, 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 the association of the genes that um, Dr. Reddy was referring to actually, you know, were improving root growth because they were protect, you know, allowing protection of the roots. So that's how you actually delivered um, better stress. So it might be that you get these things through uh, indirect ways, but directly developing a transgenic drought stress thing based on physiology um, is going to be very difficult um, given there's so many genes involved. Um, Peter Tan says that the cotton sector has its own role to play to reduce uh, climate change impacts now and in the future. He's asking a question. Any attention in this session for the contribution of agriculture and cotton production in particular on climate change? Well, I, I think you know, yes. The role that we role that cotton systems can play is by you know certainly managing cotton in a way that we maintain our soil fertility and, and health. Uh, that 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 has a role to play in terms of uh, emissions. Uh, I think that was what I was inferring maybe at the end of my presentation that when we are developing systems that so we're looking to improve uh, energy use efficiency and fuel costs and the fuel aspects of our, our production systems, which ultimately will not only assist the growers in terms of profitability, but they're the things that actually will um, reduce our impact. And um, I know that energy use is a big emphasis in, in cotton production life cycle assessments in terms of trying to reduce that component. And nitrogen fertilizer is the other one. That is the key one there too. So that the less, improvements in nitrogen use efficiency and the less we use nitrogen fertilizer uh, is certainly something that we can do to actually reduce our impact on climate change. Dr. Balasubramani from India is asking this question. Uh, he wants to know how we can increase water use efficiency in cotton. Uh, uh, given that that's getting close to the end, um, Keshev, and we're running out of time, I, I, I got the best but the best answer for that is read the book that I was recommending. It, it's got, it, it talks, it's very heavily emphasized. Um, we have many contributors talking about uh, the many aspects to improve water use fishing in cotton um, from management to genetics uh, and, and otherwise. Yeah, I think we just have one more question, which is the last. Uh, 
maybe we may have missed uh, like a couple of uh, questions here, but I think we have addressed almost uh, almost all of them. Now, this last question is, what are the top three cotton plant traits in order of priorities with maximum contribution to heat tolerance? Uh, well, I, I actually think in terms of resilient and tolerant cotton crops, the most important trait and the important management aspect is actually getting a healthy root system. So I think, you know, we, that, I, I think we need to look under the ground a lot more than we have been for many, many years and look for those opportunities. Uh, um, I think uh, water use efficiency at at the leaf level is something that we, 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 if we could look to exploit, um, but that is difficult because of temperature. Uh, and then uh, just, just improve and, and a focus on improving those, those things that I talked about, raising yield will um, improve our water use efficiency. It's gonna be very hard for us to actually get the crop to use less water, but if we wanna improve our efficiency, growing more crop for that amount of water is something that we, we can do. Um, there was this question, I mean, though I said we were, I mean, that was the last question, the previous one, but there was this, I do not know if any, I mean, if there could be a proper answer to this. This is from Dr. Abdul Rahim from Pakistan. Uh, he says, as, uh, as the temperatures rise, we are facing challenges with high infestation of sucking pests such as white flies and jacids. Uh, is there a technique to fix this problem? Uh, because uh, they're leading to yield declines. Uh, I said, uh, uh, this is a tough question in many ways, but then I'd leave it to the speakers. Well, well certainly the, ir the irony is that we're facing the same issues in Australia. White fly um, is moving into areas that we haven't seen before because of the changing climate. Uh, our emphasis is on an integrated um, pest management approach. Um, simply because, for one, the chemicals that we do need to control control, control that, uh, there, are, there are not a lot of chemicals, for one, and they white, can develop resistance very quickly in white fly. So a very heavy emphasis on integrated pest management to, to, to deal with those issues. We can't, I think the message there is, is a really important thing to finish on, is that we can't throw out our, all our fundamental ways that we manage our crop. Um, we continue to grow those principles as we move forward in, in climate change, um, such as integrated weed management, integrated pest management. All those things are still fundamental as we move forward. Yeah, there's also one yeah, more question. I think uh, this could be the last one. This is from Dr. Uh, from Dr. Singhandupe from India. He's asking a question on what is the best actual depth of placement of soil moisture sensors uh, as the cotton root goes into the deeper depth and extracts stored soil moisture. So, uh, like the question is, what is the best depth to be kept for a sensor? Um, that I think that's that's something that is specific to a region and a soil type. So we we our our soil sensors will go down to as as deep as one point five meters because that's where the cotton roots will go. But uh, that will vary um, depending on on the soil type, uh, and one of the one of the things one of the reasons why we are going above the ground and looking at plant based sensors and things like canopy temperature is we can we can use the plant to tell us when it's stressed rather than actually assuming um, where where the where, whether the plant is actually getting access to water in the ground so not not an, not an easy answer it depends <laughs> i think thank you um probably that uh, blinks us uh, to the close. But then it is true that given that there's no single solution for all the challenges raised by climate change and variability, uh, the best adaptation strategy for the industry would be, I mean, for all of us would be to develop uh, very good climate resilient systems. I mean, in terms of the soil and in terms of the varieties, I presume, uh, but, uh, I mean, like personally, I would like to thank both the speakers for the great job. Uh, these, I must confess, uh, could easily be the best two talks that I have heard uh, in uh, uh, like in a long time. So thank you so much. Uh, Kai, would you like to 
Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, Keshav. And uh, yes, we've been treated to two um, really excellent presentations on a very important subject. And I'm deeply grateful to both of you for giving up your time to be here and to give those presentations to us, especially to you, uh, Dr. Banj, as uh, I know it is um, very early or late in the morning for you, um, and uh, we're grateful to you. And, but, the, but there's also a really big thank you to all of you for attending uh, and making these uh, series of, uh, of presentations so successful. And we look forward to seeing you at our next session, which I believe is on the 2nd of December. And uh, until then, I'd like to wish you good luck, take care, stay healthy, and good night. Thank you so much. Thank you.